Have you been hiding your smile this summer? If you've been wanting a straighter smile, it's time to give Bite a try. Bite offers clear teeth aligners without the high cost of braces or endless trips to the dentist. With Bite, you'll be able to transform your smile from the comfort of your home. Their clear aligners are doctor-directed and delivered straight to your doorstep. All you need to do is take an impression mold of your mouth, preview your 3D smile, and order your all-day or at-night aligners. It's truly that simple. They even accept insurance and a HSA, FSA dollars. Sun's out, smile's out. Get started on your smile journey this summer by visiting Byte.com and use code WONDERY at checkout to get your at-home impression kit for only $14.95. That's B-Y-T-E dot com, code WONDERY. From ABC, this is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. Well, this is a surreal episode for me. Um, You're about to listen to an interview with one of my colleagues, a woman with whom I've worked for many, many years uh, and who had a lot of drama in her life that a a lot of uh, us did not know about until recently. Um, Her name is Elizabeth Vargas. Uh, She's the anchor of 2020, and she's got a new book called Between Breaths, A Memoir of Panic and Addiction. It is, as you're about to hear, uh, it, it tells the story of a, a really harrowing personal struggle on, on her part. And also, of course, uh, given that this is a, a 10% happier podcast, it, it involves uh, toward toward the back end of the story um, some meditation, which has really uh, turned out to be really useful for Elizabeth. So here we go. I give you Elizabeth. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Um, you have a, quite a story to tell, uh, but unlike most of... Uh, your interviews. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of a, uh, what may seem to you uh, of um, a odd way in, but let's just start with meditation. Okay. I know you did start meditating at some point. It's a big part of my life now. So when, how, when, and how did you start exactly? You know, when I was, um, you know, at when I was in rehab, honestly, they did sort of teach you meditation, but it was more mindfulness. Um, and there's a lot that is great about that. And I, I did that. Um, I'm a big practicer of yoga as well. And there's a part of yoga that's being centered and being aware of your body and aware of your breath and using it. Um, I do yoga breathing. I've been doing yoga breathing on airplanes, you know, for years to calm myself mm-hmm. when I start to get anxious. But um, it was a couple of years ago and George Stephanopoulos, who had sat next to me on GMA, countless hours of countless days um, talking about his practice of TM and he get getting up at this ungodly hour to do it and that, you know, uh, 20 minutes of TM was worth two hours of sleep, which I thought that's completely bogus. But if that's what it's, if, if it's even remotely maybe a tiny bit true, I'm going to try it. And I went and spent four days learning how to do it. With Bob. With Bob Roth. Bob Roth. Who at the David been, Lynch Foundation. He's been part of the transcendental meditation movement for decades. Well, and yeah. and he just they just held a huge panel with several uh, hospitals in the area about uh, transcendental meditation and recovery mm. because it's now become just recently a huge tool in recovery. Um, and I love it. I mean, I wish I'm supposed to do it twice a day for 20 minutes. Um, I realistic, and I even admitted to Bob when I saw him for this panel that I was part of. Um, that uh, I only do it once a day. And he said, that's still great. I mean, once a day is better than nothing. But I can tell, Dan, when I've gone you know, a day or two and I haven't done it at all. What, what happens? Um, it really is, for me, it's part of the reflective pause. I mean, a huge part of my story is anxiety. And when you suffer from anxiety the way I did, you react to life and everything in it like a panicky jackrabbit. <laughs> you are off that target mm-hmm. in a, you know, before you can blink. You're off and running to the races, reacting to and spinning out in whatever is frightening you at that moment or making you uncomfortable. And TM has taught me to pause. And I literally, when I start to feel anxious today, what I do now is I will stop and I will think, okay, I'm able to, it's actually, it's like, it's sort of like psychically stepping out of yourself Mm -hmm. and being able to examine and say, okay, your heart's feeling, you're racing, your your breath is feeling a little bit, why, what's happening? What's happening right now? Why are you feeling, like, examine what's going on that's making you feel anxious? Is it real? Um, 
is your being anxious going to help it? <laughs> I started to get panicky just a couple weeks ago on a flight back from Toronto to LaGuardia. It was really bumpy. And I could feel my whole body, every muscle in my body clenching in fear. And I thought to myself, okay, what's happening? We're on a bumpy flight and you're trapped on a small plane and this isn't pleasant. And that's absolutely true. And there's nothing I can do to change it. And me clenching into a ball isn't going to make the plane ride any safer or any more pleasant. So I might as well relax. So that's what TM has been able to do for me. Because a couple of years ago, I would have either had a full-blown panic attack or ordered a glass of Chardonnay Mm. to try and get myself to relax. And I'm able now to do that just, you know, through – I think I didn't meditate at that moment. But the meditation that you do every day helps. It's in your bloodstream, right? It's in your, yeah. it's in your DNA, yeah. to, so to speak. I remember Russell Brand saying it because he was part of this panel as well. And he said, praying is when I talk to God. Meditating is when God talks to me. And I, I think about that a lot because, you know, I don't be, you know, I'm not getting big, you know, um, billboards from heaven. But, you know, I, I happen to believe that um, the spiritual component of my life and my recovery um, is my belief in a higher power, which for me is God. I'm Catholic. I, I believe in God. Um, I think you get messages from God and guidance from God through your own instincts. You know, if you're quiet enough to hear them, you have to be still enough to listen to what your gut instinct and your, and your intuition is telling you. And that's the gift of meditation, is I'm finally allowing myself time to listen or time to be quiet enough for it to come through. Because I can look throughout my life, and my instincts and my tuition have never failed me, hmm. ever. I just for many years forgot to listen. But isn't panic an instinct on some level? Panic is instinct, heart, you know, that's the, 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 with bad wiring. Right, 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 right. right. Instinct and, gone awry. Yes, you know, um, and that is the result of, you know, huge fear. And I'm not going to, you know, listen, uh, anxiety and panic is a huge part of 60% of women who identify as alcoholics suffer from anxiety, 35% of men. Anxiety makes it much more difficult to get sober. You are twice as likely to relapse if you also suffer from anxiety. The latest medical research shows that we have got to get a hold of anxiety because it's causing people to act out and self-medicate in what turn out to be terribly destructive ways, as it was in my case. But I've had tremendous anxiety and panic attacks since my earliest memories. My earliest memory in my whole life is marinated in terror. Which was? I was two. I had broken my leg. I was in a cast from my hip to my ankle. And I was two years old, and I remember this. <clears throat> I was. They were lowering a saw to saw off the cast. And I was convinced they were going to saw off my leg, as any two-year-old would. Not an illogical conclusion. And all the doctors and nurses were pinning me down and holding, you know, I, you know and just sawing off the cast. So... It's just a flash frame memory. I don't remember actually breaking my leg, but I remember getting the cast on and getting it off because it frightened me. Um, So, you know, I think some people come into this world um, a little more sensitive, a little more fearful, and a little more anxious. And there are not very many tools, to be honest. You go to a doctor and you say, I'm anxious, and they'll say, here's some Ativan. Here's a prescription for Klonopin. Here's a Valium. You know, which treats the symptoms just fine, uh, but it's also highly addictive, and it doesn't treat the cause. And for me, meditating is treating the cause, is helping get you to the cause so that you can actually have the capacity to say, okay, what's scaring me? How logical is this? How is my, what is my reaction going to help? What can I do to stop this snowballing, negative, destructive reaction? So in those 20 minutes, for people who aren't familiar with Transcendental Meditation, TM, in those 20 minutes, what are you actually doing? You close your eyes. You sit in a comfortable place. Um, you, I usually uh, will – I do. I have a meditation timer app on my iPhone, so it sounds like you know a Tibetan chime. And it, for 20 minutes it goes. And you should be a place where the phone's not ringing and the kids aren't running through the room. 
and you closed your eyes and I was given a mantra, which is a word that I repeat and over and over. Sanskrit word. Yes. Which you may not – do you even know the meaning of it? I don't know the meaning of it and I've been told never to tell anybody else what it is. Yes, yes. I think it's secretly because he gave us all the same mantra, but it doesn't want us all to find out, whatever. Um, but you repeat the same mantra, and here's the key. The key is you're not supposed to try and banish all thought from your brain because that's impossible for a human being to do. And that's what caught me caught up in mindfulness meditation. I was like, but I can't stop my thoughts from popping in. And he said to me, and I will tell myself this. I told myself this this morning when I was meditating. You know, let the thoughts float by like clouds. You know, you just don't attach to it. Don't. I look at it more as balloons going by. Don't grab the string on the balloon mm -hmm. and pull That's it towards nice. you. That's good. You know, just let the balloon keep going by. So I'll have the thought and I'll think, okay, I'll remember to do that later. I'm going to let that continue floating by. And that's where that gets into the anxiety component. When you're having a panic attack, you're grabbing the string and you're tugging. You're grabbing a fistful of strings. Right, right? and a pulling million and you're not yeah. letting go to Correct. save your life. Yeah. So just that exercise, it's like going to the gym, that exercise of learning to let go of the string and let the thought just float by, I'll address that later, every day, that's what helps you when once every, thankfully now it's only once every few weeks or so, I start to feel panicky. Then I'm better able to say, okay, let go of the string. Don't attach to the fear. The fear is not taking over and encompassing my life. I'm going to survive this. It's going to be okay. The interesting thing, if you describe it beautifully, um, the interesting thing is I, I feel like maybe you got – not great mindfulness instructions because probably not because it's the same thing in both yeah but um but i feel like i uh w w what made the difference for you with tm tm is a great practice just full stop but i think what also made the difference was that bob is a great teacher oh, and you yeah. had this one person there really explaining to you because the big problem everybody has in meditation is they think i can't stop thinking mm -hmm. but you don't have to stop thinking because that's impossible. So, mm -hmm. if anybody tells you to stop thinking, they're 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 asking you to also defy gravity and all sorts of other things that are just right. impossible. Anyway, that that I say as an aside. And by the way, I think it doesn't matter what kind of meditation you do. Any time you can set aside to just stop, and I be, and I'll be honest, you don't have to meditate. Sometimes people get hung up on that. I can't meditate. It's too Eastern. It's too something. It's too exotic. You know what? Going out and sitting on a park bench and just you know, and refusing to take a phone call or listen to music just to listen. Use your five senses. There are all sorts of ways people can center themselves, and that's what it's all about. Because unless you're centered and quiet, you can't hear your own intuition, and that's what it comes down to. I think that's really true. Except for I would say what meditation does above and beyond what you're describing, and you, you really described it, I think, perfectly, is that it gives you – it is, as you said, like exercise. And it's that daily exercise of being able to watch the thoughts float by without attaching to them, without identifying with them, without clinging to them, that that when the rubber hits the road, when you're in extremis and you're freaking out, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a panic attack. It can be an urge to eat a cookie or it can right. be the urge to say something inappropriate to somebody or whatever. Or lose your temper. Yes. Mm -hmm. All of that is where it is extremely valuable. Yeah. But I'm curious with you. You said you were at this panel where they were talking about the use of TM and recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, how – how is uh, meditation specifically useful for you and, and maybe for others, apparently for others, in the world of recovery? Well, for me, I mean, the anxiety was very intertwined in the alcoholism. I mean, I used alcohol to self-medicate. Um, and I actually used it responsibly for 20, 25 years. I mean, that's my story is a little bit unusual um, in that – there are many people I know who they knew when they had their first drink, they drank until they were blacked out and then they were off to the races and it was a different kind of drinking. Um, and many people believe they were born an alcoholic and I know this is going to be controversial in the recovery world. You know, As I said in my book, I don't know that I was born an alcoholic. I don't. Um, there's a lot of medical research that supports that sometimes you become an alcoholic later in life. I didn't um, – you know, I white-knuckled my way through childhood and adolescence and college. I didn't drink a drop of alcohol in college. I didn't start drinking until I was in my 20s in this business. 
And it was a big part of, you know, life in this business. After we put on the local newscast, we'd all go to the bar and have a few drinks and then go home. And <clears throat> I drank like that, like most everybody else in my life, um, until for 25 years. When, um, when do you think it started? It, looking back now, when do you think it's Oh, spiraled? it's very clear. I mean, I had somebody who made me sit down and do a timeline. And when looking back at my timeline, it's, you know, I, it's like I fell off a cliff uh, in about 2009. Um, and so it, after your stint on World News? Yes. Just for those who may not remember. So you and I have worked together for a long time. Yeah. And um, – you were um, named as co-anchor of World News Tonight um, back in 2005 Five. with Bob Woodruff. Right. And it was a big deal, huge deal. Um, and what, four weeks into it, Bob Woodruff got – Six. Six weeks right. got yeah. hit by a bomb. Yeah. In Iraq and mm-hmm. was, you know, is, is, a, is today, as we speak, a walking miracle. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, that really kind of the, derailed, the plan, the derailed whole the whole thing. Experiment, and, yeah. And you, I think, did it alone uh, for what, a year after that? It was a year from the time. I mean, listen, Peter was, uh, it was in March that Peter announced he had cancer. Peter and Jennings it, died. Peter Jennings. Yeah. In Mar- and, in, and he died in August of 05. Right. right? Yeah. And so during the time that he was, you know, battling this disease, um, uh, Charlie and I split. Charlie Gibson. Charlie yeah. Gibson and I split the filling in duties. And then – and we continued to split the filling in duties right up until December. So from March until December, Charlie and I anchored the show, but sold, singly, 50-50. Yeah. And then in December, uh, David Weston uh, – you know, had a really bold experiment. He and, was then the president of then ABC the president News, of ABC yeah. News, and he decided to try having a co-anchoring team, and with an emphasis because both Bob and I at that point were, you know, and are still um, reporters, and wanted one of us out in the field a lot to travel the newscast a lot to be live on the West Coast, and it was a very ambitious plan, and he convinced me of it. He, it, I took some convincing. That wasn't a job that I'd ever. Uh, sort of set on my goal my goal list you know um, I had never been a reporter for world news I was always a morning uh, show person or a magazine show person mm-hmm. so we were named in early December Bob and I as co-anchors and then at the end of January the very I think it was January 28th or 29th that Bob was hit in Iraq and uh, and then I continued at that point I was two months pregnant so I had to tell David I was pregnant. I mean, I can't believe everything David Weston had to put do in that single cal- calendar year. It's as- astonishing to have Peter diagnosed with cancer, die of cancer, um, Bob to name Bob and me, have Bob nearly killed, and then I had to say I'm you know I'm I'm pregnant and I you know I'm going to have to go on maternity leave, and even under the you know I'll come back after four weeks, but you know I had a new I would have a newborn and anyway. Uh, so I did the show by myself until the end of May, at which point Charlie Gibson was named the anchor and took over. Which was con- – w- there was controversy over that, if I recall. People I, did rally to your side and uh, – Yeah, there were some people who you know rallied to my side. And the truth is I've been – you know, as, as I've said in the book, was in fact that I was demoted. And I, that was part of the reason I think I was really struggling uh, when I came back to work later that year. Um, because while I – grew to understand that it was, in fact, not only the best thing for the news division to have Charlie be the anchor of this show, um, it was the best thing for me. I mean, it was I, I was deluding myself to think that I could – I had a three-year-old and a newborn, I and I was nursing, you know. I. Yeah, but let me just say you were a great anchor. And Thank I you. remember, you know, I was then a, a real rank-and-file correspondent. I think it was the anchor of the weekend show, which had been your alma mater, mm-hmm. which is yeah. your alma mater. And yeah. um, and my my world was to uh, file a script for the uh, for yeah. the evening news and then come down and, and get uh, hazed by the senior producers and the anchor. And I remember you would always pipe up with a really smart question late in the process and like, oh, yeah, that's what we ought to do. Oh, um, thank you. So I have real memories of, uh, of those stress-filled later hours of yeah. the day running up to the newscast and, um, and having a very positive working relationship with you. So um, – 
uh, I don't know, whatever stories you're telling yourself now, you were very good at the, at the oh, job. Oh, thank you. But I can um, imagine that the process of, as you say, being demoted was very stressful and, and must have or may have been a contributor to what uh, came later. It was. I think, listen, uh, I think what happened was uh, after I came back to work, first of all, I thought I had postpartum depression. I was convinced I had it. I was There was something different after I had Sam. Um, this is baby number one? Two. Two. Okay. And uh, I, I, I remember going to my doctor and she sent me to an expert and the expert looked at me and said, you're just anxious. And I was like, anxious? I've been anxious all my life, <laughs> you know, but now I can't sleep. Now I can't focus. Now I'm, I, I would cry. I would just sit and cry. Hmm. Um, I was sure I had postpartum depression. Um, I came back to work and, um, and the reality of, you know, the demotion, I think, set in and hit. Um, uh, painful. It, it was very painful and very humiliating. Yes. I took it very personally. Of course. How could um, you not? Well, because I think the key to uh, – there's a great book called The Four Agreements. And you know, it sets out four things you should agree to do every single day as you set out. And one is to be impeccable with your word. Number two is not to take things personally. Number three is not to assume. And number four is to always do your best. And number two and three really hit home for me. I always assume the worst and I take it all incredibly personally. Like I'm the only person who's ever been demoted. And this is all because I'm terrible. And it fed into all my insecurity and all, you know, and I took it and it, it, then it became like I was offended, you know, that I couldn't, I wasn't even on the booking list. I couldn't get Eric Offram to return my phone calls. It so was, let me just explain to people what that is. The booking list is the the list of people who are going to get the big bookings, the next mm-hmm. big interview. Eric Offram is the guy who is our, one of our executives overseas who's going to get the next big interview. So yes, I can see how. Yeah. It feels personal. Look, yeah. obviously, I'm not the right person to give you objective advice here because I'm in the same world as you. Uh, but it would feel personal to me. Let me just say it felt very personal. But I and I lost and it was perspective. public. It was, it was public. Very it was public. very public. So um, and I had to go on Oprah and tell her it was my decision. And I you know, gave a lot of you know that's how we what we said to the National Organization of Women, which said, "Wait a second, why are you booting the the woman?" to make way for yet another man. And I was like, no, it's my decision. And, but that know, wasn't quite true. It wasn't true. It wasn't true. But that's what I needed to say in order to um, help the news division and keep my job. I was Nobody ever said, you'll lose your job. But I knew that that was, you know, uh, I needed to make this okay. So Why is it your job to make it okay? I'm not really sure. Looking back on it, I think I was naive. I was, you know, I, looking back on it, I remember being in utter shock when I was told this news. Um, and, you know, I still remember the words, the words that, you know, and, and I, you have to remember, Dan, I'm, I'm, you know, we haven't spoken about this, but along with my anxiety, I'm tremendously insecure, <laughs> like childishly so. Um, well, look, uh, m- uh, you're you're in good company. Let's just say. I mean, yeah. a lot of us in TV news, especially those of us in front of the camera, yeah. have this insecurity. And by the way, I think even if you come in without it, you're going to start getting it because we're in public and people yeah. are judging us and we're competing against other people. It's a, yeah. it's going to bring out your insecurity. Yeah, my you know um, my ex husband said to me, and I was surprised when he told me this, but he said, you know, I remember it was one of our very first dates. He said, I told him. You will never meet anybody in your life more insecure than me. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I told you that. <laughs> I was so honest. Um, but it's true. And so when David Weston said to me in that meeting, you know, um, I just remember – I remember I couldn't breathe, which was probably partly due to my anxiety and partly due to the baby and my – you know, pushing up against my diaphragm, which I always had trouble with. Um and I didn't want to cry. Like I really didn't want to burst into tears and cry. And so I was holding everything in. And I just remember him saying to me, if you choose to leave this network, we won't stand in your way. Wow. And I was like, choose to leave this network? I've been here for 10 years. I'm about to give birth. Where am I going to go? Like I didn't read that as – which is the way I think he probably meant it. 
if you're angry and want to go to NBC or CBS and you know take your ball and leave, we won't stop you even though you're under contract. I took it as we don't value you. So please go out the door. You know? Well, let me just come to your defense on that one because that's how I would take it. Maybe we're oh, both crazy, yeah. but that's how I would take it. Well, that's how I took it. We're probably both crazy. And when I told my agent that night when I got home and you know called him and told him what happened, and he said he's, he my agent number one was shocked this happened, which is never a good was a good sign. Um, we pay these guys to have their ears to gr- to the ground and not be shocked by demotions as big and huge as this. I mean, it was on the front page of the New York yeah. Times. Yeah, I remember. Um, and you know, sparked a book and sparked many cover stories, magazine covers. This was huge news. The battle behind the scene over the anchor chair at ABC, and you know, I wasn't even—I didn't battle for it, and I got booted from it, and um, and felt like a passive participant in everything. Like I didn't—that's my mistake. I didn't—I didn't have the confidence or the experience to um, to decide to be. Very calculating as we have to be at certain points, and and about okay, what are my strengths? What do I think? I, what would make me happy? What do I have the best chance of succeeding at? What plays to my strengths? Let's do that and set a course. I was sort of on a raft on a river, floating along, and then taken by surprise when you know some things happen that didn't go my way. Yep. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. We bring to life some of the biggest controversies in U.S. history, events that have shaped who we are as a country and that continue to define the American experience. American Scandal tells marquee stories about American politics, like the break-in at the Watergate Hotel, an event that led to the downfall of a president and raised questions about the future of American democracy. We go behind the scenes looking at devastating financial crimes, like the fraud committed at Enron and Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. And we tell stories of complicated public figures like Edward Snowden and Monica Lewinsky, people who found themselves thrust into the spotlight and who spur debates about the future of the country. Follow American Scandal wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Welcome to the Bishop Gray Academy, the country's most exclusive boarding school, a place where the best and brightest aren't fighting to be prom queen or captain of the football team. They're on track to become the next Supreme Court Justice. Academy is a new scripted podcast that follows Ava Richards, a brilliant scholarship student who must quickly adapt in a school where rules mean nothing and money means everything. Ava sets her sights on being the first scholarship student to make the list. Bishop Gray's all-coveted academic top 10, curated by the headmaster himself, But with no clear path to the top, she joins the Knight of the Wolf, Bishop Gray's underground society with more secrets than the Illuminati. If she bends to their demands in exchange for her own success, one of the 10 coveted spots will be hers. But at what cost? Enjoy Academy on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. Binge all 10 episodes of Academy early and ad free on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus over on the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. So anyway, so I came back to work and I was feeling pretty, you know, I had the postpartum whatever, anxiety, according to the doctor. For me, it felt like really a bad postpartum blues. Um, I had a really big shock about the job. I was um, the bread. I am still to this day. I've always have been the breadwinner of my family. I support my husband or my now ex-husband and both of my children and the nannies that we needed to employ to help because I was working very long hours and um, – you know, I'm very lucky to be able to afford help. Um, my working mom story is a story of privilege compared to most other working mom stories. But it's interesting that in researching, um, you know, alcoholism in women, um, women are much more likely to use alcohol to self-medicate for stress and anxiety. And I had both in spades at that point. And to top it off, a marriage that wasn't in a great spot. Mm. You know, I didn't feel supported, and I'm sure he could say the same thing and many others. Um, And I started drinking more to self-medicate what I felt was, well, what I know was an enormous amount of stress and an enormous amount of anxiety and unhappiness. Instead of addressing the problems maturely, um, I, you know, what what my go-to had always been 
uh, for 25 years to get home at the end of the day and take the edge off, as I as I told Diane Sawyer, who's done an hour on 2020 on this whole thing. Incredibly powerful. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And I want to talk because I know how it feels uh, to ex- you know be exposed in this way. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, we'll, we'll get there. Um, so so your go to drink at the end of the day was you were starting to say it was always a glass of Chardonnay. Uh-huh. But I said to Diane, I said you don't drink alcohol because you like the taste. You drink it because you like the way it makes you feel. Otherwise, you'd be drinking iced tea, or <laughs> you know herbal herbal tea, or you know a, a soda, or juice. You know the reason we drink cocktails is because we like the way it makes us feel. And for me, part of that equation, even from the start, was to soften the edges of my anxiety Mm -hmm. and the stress. And as I wrote in my book, everybody looked more interesting and prettier and smarter after a glass of wine, including me. (laughs) You know, it gave me the confidence that I didn't inherently have. So, um, Sadly, I had, you know, for 25 years, it, I drank uh, like everybody else. But at some point when the anxiety got bigger and the stress got bigger and the unhappiness was bigger, I started drinking more. And that's the difference. Everybody else stops, mm. you know. Not everybody else. No, but. People who aren't don't have alcoholism. Right. right. People who don't have an issue with drinking. Although, you know, there are millions and millions of people with an issue with drinking. Yes, there are. That's why I said not everybody else because yeah. it is, you're not alone. This is, as you know, this is a widespread, widespread issue. Yeah. This is why I think your book is very important. Um, how, 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 how hard did it get for you? How bad did it get? The drinking? Yeah. At the very end, it was very hard and very dark. I mean, you know, I think that um, there were many times in the last – I would say 18 months of my drinking where I just thought, how did I get here? Like, how how did I get here? What happened to my life? I mean, I nearly lost everything. I mean, what, how did you nearly lose everything? Well, I had a terrible incident one day where uh, I blacked out. The only time in my life, you know, I'm one of the, you know, there are many drinkers who black out all the time. I, I didn't. I never, I you know, I was never the woman who had to be helped out of a party, or who you know fell down or passed out or got sick. I, I that, those my girlfriends were all like, "What? You know, we all thought so and so was the person with the drinking problem. You've never had a lampshade on your head. I mean, to use a cliche, but you know, I, there, those incidents had never happened mm-hmm. in all those years. Um, but I did have a blackout. Uh, in the very end, and my blood alcohol level was 0.4, which is lethal. Wow, wow! And, uh, I mean, a 0.08 is the, is the yeah. threshold for DUI. Yeah. So 0.4. 0.4. What was going on at that point? Um, I remember that I had been drinking a lot. I'm small. I wasn't eating. And at a certain point when you're drinking that much alcohol, you get to – you wake up in the mornings and the only thing that will make you feel better is more alcohol. Like it's – I call it chasing your tail. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's had an alcohol problem will understand exactly what I'm describing and it's terrible. I still to this day wake up every morning and feel thankful that I feel great. Mm -hmm. Because there were so many years, you know, in the end um, of mornings when I woke up and I had a headache or I felt shaky or I felt dehydrated and sick because I'd been drinking the night before. At a certain point, your body can't do it, you know. I don't know if it's age or just the passage of time. Um, But we also – I learned from all this – from this doctor I just interviewed actually – who's the leading expert on all this, that at a certain point when you're drinking like that, your body, the, the your, your baseline is different. It changes your body. So you need a glass or two of wine just to feel normal, just to feel like you feel. Yeah, it's like a every death day. spiral. It's a total death spiral, a slow, steady, inexorable death spiral. So, at the, and that's what I can now, like I used to for, 
look back with puzzlement, like, why did I do that? And the interesting thing is, is that now, you know, having interviewed all these doctors and interviewed all these experts, I understand it now. Like, there's an actual biological reason for what, what was happening, that your baseline was lower, that you were going through alcohol withdrawal, that that ramped up the anxiety. So the alcohol, that the anxiety that I was drinking to quench and quell the anxiety was now like irretrievably huge, mm. you know, had just blown up um, into something much, much bigger than it ever would have been in the worst panic attack. Does that explain why, and this was the case with you, rehab doesn't always work the first time? Listen, um, rehab, there, rehabs are all different. There are some great rehabs and there are some terrible rehabs. I went to, uh, you know, a, a really great rehab and a rehab that was terrible for me, wasn't good for me. I didn't pick it, the second one. How many did you go to? Two. And the second one took, though? Um, not totally, no. So? No. How'd... What finally happened in the end for me was I just decided I, 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 I need to stop. I have to stop. I, will, I, I have come to the point where I will lose everything. I will lose my job. I will lose my children. I've lost my husband. Um, I will lose my life. I will lose everything precious and dear to me if I continue doing this. When was that moment? That wasn't until two years ago, two and a half years ago. After the second rehab, I came home. And, um, you know, that was a bad experience for me. I just, all I was focused on doing was getting out of there. Mm. It was even my therapist assigned to me at that rehab said to me several times, how did you end up here? This is not the right place for you. And uh, and I remember bursting into tears and saying, I, 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 don't, I didn't pick it. You know? Who picked it? Uh, my therapist at the time who was barely knew me. And listen, this is a racket. These guys get sent. They get invited by these rehab centers to sem- spend a weekend. Uh. And they invite all these therapists from all over the country to come spend a weekend and check out our place. And they show all the great things, knowing and betting that that therapist will then go back to his or her city of choice or where they live. And when they have a patient who comes in and says, I think I need rehab, they go, oh, go to this place I just saw. It's a business. It's Hmm. a big business for better or for worse. There are, you know, do the math. There are millions, tens of millions of alcoholics in this country. If 50 percent of them go to rehab, 20 percent of them go to rehab, it's a lot of money to be made. So two years ago uh, – so how sturdy do you think it, the, the, the sobriety is and what are you doing to, to make sure it's ironclad? Today, it, meaning today now? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let me just finish the story, the sure, question you sure, asked sure. about the, the second rehab. So I, I, I was just focused on getting home, which mm-hmm. was the wrong – you know, it was terrible. And I, I got home and, um, you know, uh, found out within a week of getting home that um, that I my husband wanted a divorce. And, you know, some other revelations followed that were very painful. And it was it was literally they tell you in rehab or in recovery, any place they'll tell you in the first year of your sobriety, don't make any major life decisions. Don't even start a relationship. Don't start dating anybody like literally that first year protect your sobriety at all costs because it's very fragile. And, you know, I was buffeted by life events and um, and did relapse. And it was after that relapse. Uh, and I didn't go to rehab. I came back home and um, worked with fellow alcoholics and um, learned, you know, to meditate and um, in when I came home, I was in the bubble of rehab. I could see right away all the da- – it's very – my instinct is that well, it wasn't as bad to minimize what I did and how bad it is. And, and when you're in the bubble of rehab where um, you don't have to face your children's faces or hear your husband's fury – or speak to your agent and hear him say, I don't know if ABC is going to take you back, you know, and they're not going to pay you right now, you know, while you figure out if you can stay sober. 
Uh, and, you know, I wasn't protected from the consequences of any of my terrible, terrible, selfish, destructive decisions. And you eventually have to reach the point. I mean, I will, I will tell you that for the longest time, I didn't want to stop drinking. I just wanted it to work again. Mm. I wanted to be able to manage my anxiety again because I couldn't stand being left sitting with it. And you have to reach the point where you realize it won't ever work. I somehow passed that point. It will never work for me. So I have to find another way to manage the anxiety. And I have. How strong, I mean, how, I said before, how sturdy do you think your sobriety is? How big, of, how much of a daily struggle is it for you now, two years out? It's not a struggle <laughs> per se, um, I didn't ever, but I never take it for granted. I mean, I go to meetings um, nearly every day where I talk with other people who are alcoholics. Um, and I hear things, you know, from other people in totally different walks of life that are incredibly valuable and helpful to me. I meditate. Um, I read. You know, I do readings like little, you know, whatever it does. For me, managing the anxiety is a huge – because it's so tied up in why I drank. Um, but, you know, maybe it's because it's been out of my system for so long, but all those physiological changes that were – I don't le need two drinks anymore or one drink or even a sip of anything to feel like you do when you wake up. I feel normal now and feel okay now. So uh, – and it's incredible to me how much less anxiety I have. I didn't realize until I stopped drinking how much the alcohol had been fueling the anxiety even long before the drinking turned truly destructive. I mean, all those years when I thought I was managing my anxiety with it, I wasn't. It was slowly, you know, it wasn't, you know, I thought it was making it better, but it wasn't. What did it do, what did your drinking do to your relationship with your your sons? Well, they know everything, obviously. Um, you know, my story, you know, somebody asked me the other day, would I have written this book? If my story hadn't been made public, because I didn't make my story public, that it got was, leaked. To the it was papers, leaked yeah. not once but four times. Um, so I felt very outed and terribly. You know, that first time that happened was uh, when I had to issue a statement from rehab. That was terribly uh, distressing, and not the thing you should be doing in rehab is, you know, is crafting a statement. Um, so my kids have known. You know, more than they probably should have. Listen, my kids have been through a lot. Um, but they're amazing boys. And the self-confidence that eludes me on so many – in so many other areas of my life um, does not elude me in this. Um, I know I am an amazing mother to them. I, I, I am, and I work at it. I make, I, it's not something I take for granted, and it's something I not only uh, embrace fully, but I still – I mean, I was playing Crazy Eights with Sam, my youngest, the other night, and even two nights ago at the kitchen table, I remember looking up at him and looking at his face and feeling the joy and taking it in, you know, because – that's what so many of us don't do in our lives. Mm -hmm. We're so busy running, we're not taking it in, anything. You know, and that's what my life today is. It's a practice of taking it in, and that's everything. That's not just the big exciting moments. It's actually more importantly just how the sky looks on my walk home or the, the air, the way it smells as I'm walking through Central Park. You know, I walked with my kids in Central Park for two hours on Sunday, and they never looked up from their phones because they were looking for Pokemon. But, you know, <laughs> I did, and I loved being with them. I loved that they were so excited to show me what they were catching and evolving in their game, and I love taking in the natural beauty around me. And that's what keeps me sober is just I haven't lost sight, and I hope I never lose sight of how incredibly fortunate I am to have this life, to be alive, to have these boys – to live where I do, to um, have the job I have. You talk about the anxiety being the sort of root of all of this, but you're now putting yourself in a position where you're about to publish a book where mm. you – all this is – you know, yes, there were some leaks in the paper, but now you're telling the whole story. Yeah. Granted, you're telling it on your own terms, but still it's uh, – I know from experience that it's a um, – 
you're going to be having second thoughts and oh my god well, I've already had them <laughs> yeah so well, how's that going for you and is it is it is it making you anxious in a way that is troublesome no I'm terrified but um listen um there were moments in the last few months when I thought, oh, my God, can I undo this somehow? Like I actually contemplated, like, can I go to the publisher and just pay them back all the money and, you know, uh, say never mind? I had those thoughts, too. Yeah. My mother actually begged me. Did she really? Not to publish the book. Yeah. Why? Because she's a mother. She's a good mother. She was. She was just thought I was going to, you know, going admitting that I had a Coke problem and had a panic attack on national television. She thought. She had she had the last minute heebie-jeebies, and I don't blame her. Yeah, but I it was too late. Yeah, I, there, I definitely wanted to. I had second thoughts about it, and oddly enough, it's my family who had the most trepidation also about it. But I think in my case, because they're mentioned in the book, you know, um, and I I think that it, my sister said to me, it feels weird to have our family, you know, out there, mm. even though it was mostly in. A very, very positive way. I mean, my brother, my sister, my mom and dad are the people who saved me, you know, who helped me in the very most difficult days. Um, I don't know. I'm a little bit – listen, the hardest part about this, Dan, is, you know, the fact that we put ourselves out there and I know how lonely I felt when I was suffering from this. And if I can make anybody feel any less lonely, I think that would be a gift. And they say in recovery that we're supposed to help other people. And, you know, this was the one of the ways I think I can do that. I hope it also helps people with family members who are suffering because I want them to know that don't take it personally. It's not about you. If your parent or spouse is drinking, it's not because they don't love you. It's because they don't love themselves enough. It's because they're in so much pain they'll do anything not to feel it. And I know that there are so many family members out there, families of alcoholics who are tremendously hurt and devastated, rightly so, by the actions of the alcoholic. Um, but it can be somewhat helpful to know um, it's not about you. This doesn't mean they don't love you. It's just there's something terrible going on inside that person. It is a disease. It is a brain disease. And to just simply tell an alcoholic to stop drinking – is like telling somebody with depression to be happy. Mm -hmm. Just smile. Yeah, g right. get over it. Yeah, you can't. Y y it takes more than that. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for writing the book. I think uh, it's going to help a lot of people. I hope so. Okay, there's another edition of the 10 Percent Happier podcast. If you liked it, please make sure to uh, subscribe, rate us, and uh, if you want to suggest topics we should cover or guests uh, we should bring in, hit me up on Twitter at Dan B Harris. I also want to thank heartily the people who produce this podcast and really do pretty much all the work: Lauren Efron, Josh Cohan, Sarah Amos, Andrew Kalb, Steve Jones, and the head of ABC News Digital, Dan Silver. Uh, I'll talk to you next Wednesday. 